Trita Parsi, he is author of Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Victory of Diplomacy, or for Diplomacy. Did I get that right, Trita? Triumph of Diplomacy. The Triumph of Diplomacy. Pardon me. Trita, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, Trita, I, I've, I've spoken to you before. I've appreciated your work for a long time, and I really appreciated an interaction you had last week on MSNBC where you were on a panel with Bill Kristol, who uh, most people listening to this or watching this will know is a kind of primarily known, his sort of primary contribution to American life, I guess other than sort of scouting Sarah Palin, is agitating for wars across the Middle East. And you were on this panel and you had an interesting response to his um, claiming of affinity and solidarity with people inside Iran uh, marching for greater economic and civil rights. Yeah, essentially I, I was giving a response explaining some of the causes for these protests and some of the causes for the economic grievances, which includes the uh, problems with sanctions relief under the nuclear deal caused by Donald Trump. And he jumps in and essentially rejects that and says that uh, the real only cause that exists is that the Iranians want freedom and, and says that we need to respect the Iranian people. Now, of course, hmm. uh, the desire for freedom in Iran is very strong, but the idea that he would be telling me to respect the Iranian people, I was not going to let that pass without giving him an answer. And I right. pointed out to him that after years of arguing, uh, bombing Iran, and advocating killing Iranians, he's in no position to claim to respect the Iranian people. Yeah, and what did you make of, I mean, I, I just thought it was very revealing because, the, you know, there was this sort of reaction on the panel from the host, um, almost as if you were being uncivil to Bill Crystal, and you weren't. I mean, you certainly tonally, you know, you didn't yell, you didn't hyperventilate. You just said something that was just demonstrably true, and I'm just kind of wondering that. And we'll we'll move to the administration in in a second, which is I guess you know is at this point more to the point than Bill Crystal. But what do you make of this kind of odd paradox and problem in American discourse, where we could kind of get on a tree to Parsi for just correctly noting what Bill Crystal's not only you know. Not some errant, stupid comment that he made in 2003, but a sort of decades-long project of foreign policy agitation that to sort of note that is somehow un, you know, not civil or, or inappropriate, that we have to take this kind of rhetoric at face value. Yeah, I have to tell you, one of the things I was most shocked by was how the host came to his defense right. and even said, uh, you know, let's get it straight, Bill Crystal has not advocated killing Iranians. And I had to correct her and say, not at all. Right. Uh, he has. Um, and I don't know if it is because she's just completely ignorant and has no idea about anything. I mean, let's be frank, it's not as if all of these anchors are particularly knowledgeable about the topics that they bring in guests to talk about. Present company accepted, of course. No, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but at the same time, it, it's it does seem to fit into a pattern in which the memory um, of the media is extremely short, and particularly now when there are good reasons to be critical of many of Trump's policies and behaviors, there seems to be a desire to be completely forgiving uh, of anything the neocons have done simply because they oppose Trump. Now, they opposed Trump mainly because Trump rejected them, right. not because of any other reason. Um, but it's, it's still highly problematic because just because they opposed Trump doesn't mean that that whitewashes what they have done with the Iraq war that still is causing thousands of people to die in the Middle East and, and hundreds and hundreds of Americans who uh, continue to suffer from that war as well. It's 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 pretty sad because if we allow ourselves to forget, rest assured, we will also allow us to repeat these mistakes. 
Right, no doubt. And and not only that, I mean, yes, Donald Trump rejected them rhetorically, but certainly with regards to Iran policy, uh, he's very much embracing that neocon uh, legacy. So let's get to that. There, It seems as if the protests in Iran have generally kind of been sort of dying down a bit. Uh, you know, it's very unclear um, exactly what was happening with the reporting emanating out of Iran. My read was that a lot of the protests seemed to be driven by actually some very familiar issues across the globe, you know, inequality, uh, political cronyism, uh, dysfunction, dysfunctional and parasitic relationships between kind of the business class and the governing class, which have shrunk opportunities. Uh, there's that whole Instagram feed you can see of the, the rich kids of Tehran, which are these, you know, the princesses and princes of the kind of government sh and, and other wealthy elites showing off their wealth. It seems like these protests were maybe very much not uh, they there was an objection to the human rights record certainly but a lot of the objections were also in on you know day in and day out issues that you might find in many other parts of the world you know uh, dealing with the the present situation we're in internationally certainly and, and and it was actually quite interesting to see that many of these causes are economic grievances that we are finding in many different places driven by similar type of economic policies or lack of policies at times. Now, of course, in the Iranian context, you always have uh, a situation in which there isn't a full acceptance of the current regime. So when protests of this kind happen, uh, it is not unusual that there would also be slogans not just against economic policy, but also against the regime as a whole uh, and its very existence and just uh, and uh, whether it should continue. In this specific case, that happened tremendously fast. And, and it was very, very hard hitting. And uh, I think it is a sign that there is a tremendous amount of discontent uh, in the society, precisely for the reasons that you mentioned, the economic inequality, cronyism, corruption, mismanagement, but there's also uh, the political and social frustration that have never gone away mm -hmm. precisely because of the repressive nature uh, of the Islamic Republic. And one of the things that was fascinating with all of this is that the people who seem to be driving those protests, at least after the first day, seem to be people who actually were not bought into the idea that there is a possibility for change from within, right. Right. who believe that there can be reform, but people who either have lost hope in that or who never believed it in the first place. Now, do you think that that, and this will cover, I guess, the reactions inside, we'll talk about the reactions inside Iran itself before we get back to to uh, to Trump and, and the neocons and so on. The, uh, it, so the rea the reaction was interesting because the the supreme leader basically blamed uh, outside agitators and maybe you could speak to that as well. I don't think there's any contradiction between absolutely recognizing that there's plenty of organic and natural grievance and opposition inside Iran and also that of course the sort of intelligence apparatus of a foreign adversary might be interested in taking advantage of that there's no real contradiction but he basically came out and said you know this is all outside agitators blah 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 uh, president rouhani seemed to strike a very different note yes from the very beginning uh rouhani adopted a different tone in which he was acknowledging the protesters right to protest uh, acknowledging some of their frustrations. Um, and this was quite uh, quite unusual because, I mean, some of the slogans were targeting the regime as a whole and even calling for um, uh, Khamenei's death. So for him to come out and say that, you know, they have a right to protest, that's, it is a way for him to also criticize the uh, conservatives. The background to all of this is that uh, in mid-December, he gives a speech in the parliament and starts giving a hint about some of the things that's going to be in the proposed budget. And there he raises question marks about billions of dollars that are going to various conservative 
controlled Islamic charities with no accountability, no transparency, and starts essentially raising question marks as to why they should be in the budget in the first place. Hi, folks. Sam Cedar here. We still need your help on our Patreon page. YouTube ads have come back, but not nearly as much as we had before. So if you can help us out, any little bit helps. Head over to our Patreon page right at this URL, and you'll help us keep helping you by making videos.